I'm speaking to you from Glucksman Ireland House at New York University and this is a video summary of the fourth lecture in a course I'm teaching here at the University entitled Literature as History Ireland 1880 to 1940. Now today's lecture which I am providing a summary of for those who are not students at NYU but uh, who may be interested in uh, Irish literature and Irish history and I hope that you'll find this uh, summary of today's lecture um, of interest. Uh, I'm talking today about um, the poet W.B. Yeats and the contribution he made to the development of Irish identity in the latter part of the 19th century and the early uh, years of 20th century. Yeats was um, active in um, cultural politics in Ireland uh, between 1885 uh, and uh, when he first became involved with uh, seeing himself as an Irish writer and 1904 when uh, together with Lady Gregory and a. George Russell, he uh, founded the Abbey Theatre, which remains today um, a vital institution, uh, the Irish National Theatre. So I want to look today at um, the contribution Yeats made to this um, formative period in Irish history when uh, the definition of Irish identity changed through the um, impact of the Gaelic League and its effort to restore and revive the Irish language and the Gaelic Athletic Association encouraging young Irish people to play Irish games of hurling and Gaelic football. So we start then um, describing Yeats's background. Uh, Yeats was born in 1865 in Dublin. Uh, his family were the epitome really of uh, middle-class uh, Irish um, Protestants. Um, on one side of his family, he was descended from um, his great-grandfather and grandfather, had both been um, clergymen, Church of Ireland clergymen. Um, his father turned away from religion and became a skeptic and agnostic, and yet tried to find a path in between those two um, positions with regard to religion and he became interested in uh, the New Age religions like Theosophy and also had a lifelong interest in the occult. Um, so in his early years uh, Yeats uh, grew up uh, between living between Dublin, London and uh, Sligo where he spent uh, significant amounts of time visiting his uh, mother's family. His mother's family were um, the Polexvans, they were uh, merchants uh, in uh, Sligo quite a prosperous and prominent local family and probably the happiest uh, times during Yeats's childhood was spent with his mother's family in Sligo. And that's why a lot of his poems have uh, Sligo as their um, geographical location. Yeats, in 1885, um, suddenly um, discovered his Irish identity and discovered his vocation uh, as an Irish poet, which he never strayed from, despite the frustrations and disenchantments that he suffered in the uh, years ahead. He once said um, that um, when he was 20 years of age, um, my subject matter became Irish. Dennis Donoghue, the uh, distinguished uh, literary critic and longtime uh, professor at uh, New York University, once wrote that uh, Yeats um, invented a country calling it Ireland. So he, he credited Yeats with having contributed significantly to the creation of modern Irish identity. The poet T.S. Eliot once said that Yeats is one of those writers whose history is the history of their own time, which cannot be understood without them. So Yeats, recognised by critic and fellow poet as an important figure in the development of Irish identity uh, in the period uh, between 1885 and 1905 um, 
We'll talk about the, the later Yeats uh, in a subsequent lecture in this uh, course. So why did Yeats um, suddenly um, discover uh, his uh, desire to be an Irish poet? Well, it's down to uh, his meeting in 1885 with the Fenian, John O'Leary. O'Leary had been involved in the Young Ireland movement of the 1840s and the Fenian movement of the 1860s. He had been um, jailed for five years in Britain, then exiled for 15 years in France, and returned to Ireland in January of 1885, together with his sister, the poet Ellen O'Leary, and uh, established a established himself in, in uh, a Dublin suburb and became a, a focal point for a new generation of uh, Irish people interested in um, learning uh, about um, their identity from the, uh, the uh, life and the, the um, opinions of John O'Leary. He was impressed by O'Leary. He said that he had the moral genius that moves all young people. Uh, he was impressed by some of what, some of the things O'Leary said. For example, he once he quoted O'Leary as saying, "There are things that a man must not do to save a nation," and also, "Never has there been a cause so bad that it has not been defended by good men for good reasons." So, O'Leary became a model for Yeats as to um, the, the character of what Yeats referred to as Romantic Ireland. And in 1913, when Yeats was deeply disenchanted with developments in Ireland, he um, lionised O'Leary and um, established O'Leary as a, the epitome of Romantic Ireland and uh, contrasting O'Leary with some of the lesser political figures that were dominant at that time. And in his famous lines from September 1913, he wrote, Romantic Ireland is dead and gone, it's with O'Leary in the grave. So he, he saw O'Leary as the kind of last vestige of that romantic Irish nationalist tradition that uh, drew it to it through O'Leary in the 1880s. Um, he credited O'Leary with um, uh, turning him towards being an Irish poet. He talked about um, debates that they had at the Young Ireland Society, which um, O'Leary established and where um, nationalist views were discussed and where um, he had deepened his knowledge of Irish history and literature. He once wrote, from these debates, from O'Leary's conversation, and from the Irish books he lent or gave me, has come all I have set my hand to since. I had begun to know a great deal about the Irish poets who had written in English. I read with excitement books I should find unreadable today and found romance in lives that had neither wit nor adventure. I thought we might bring the halves, the Catholic and the Protestant, together if we had a literature that made Ireland beautiful in the memory and yet had been freed from provincialism by an exacting criticism, a European pose. That could be regarded as a manifesto for the remainder of Yeats's life as an Irish poet. Yeats was moved by the, the fall of Parnell in 1891. He wrote about that in a, an undistinguished poem, but he saw potential for a cultural revival to be um, initiated uh, in the, the aftermath of the, the shock of Parnell's fall from grace and then his subsequent death in 1891. And within eight months of, um, of Parnell's death, uh, he had um, initiated the founding of the Irish Literary Society in London in May of 1892. And later that summer, the National Literary Society was established in Dublin. So Yeats was seeking to, to build a national literature for Ireland in the English language. And he once wrote um, that the Irish heroic cycle, the poems about Cúchulainn and the Fianna, was one of the 
and I quote, seven great fountains in the garden of the world's imagination. So he saw the Gaelic past as having something special. And he said that this literature could bring forth living waters for the healing of our nation, helping us to live in the larger life of the spirit. So this was not a modest endeavor. This was Yeats believing that there was something special in the Gaelic past, in Gaelic literature, and in the folklore of the Irish people that could bring forth, forth a new great utterance for which the world is waiting. Something that would be uh, an alternative to what he saw as the excessively materialistic imperial literature of the late 19th century. Yeats wrote that, at one stage he wrote that, there is no literature without nationality and no nationality without literature. Now, that assertion was challenged on two sides, a number of sides. First of all, you had those like uh, Edward Dowden, the uh, poet and critic and Trinity College academic, who was a friend of Yeats's father, but who did not believe that Ireland had that capacity to create that literature of the kind that Yeats aspired to bring into being. You had people like John Pentland Mahaffey, uh, the provost of Trinity College, other Trinity academics who looked down on the idea of creating a literature out of this Gaelic material, which they felt was, was of an inferior quality. Yeats took a different view. And then you had someone like James Joyce, who believed that Yeats was making too many concessions to popular taste. He said that the, the Irish, Joyce was very trenchant in his criticism of Yeats and the Literary Theatre in a pamphlet he wrote, published in 1902 when he was only 20 years of age. And he said that the Literary Theatre uh, must now be considered the property of the rabblement of the most belated race in Europe. And he said that Yeats uh, had, distributed, had displayed a treacherous instinct of adaptability. That Yeats was making too many concessions to popular taste. And Joyce insisted, until the artist frees himself from the mean influences around him, in Joyce's view, he is no artist at all. It was a pretty trenchant criticism of Yeats from a young man like, Yeats, like Joyce. But Joyce was, was certainly not short of self-confidence, uh, bordering on arrogance, I would say. So, and there were also those, of course, within the nationalist tradition who wanted to produce a more openly political form of literature. And Yeats, of course, wanted to try to, and he said in one of his poems, wrote in to Ireland in the coming times, that he should, uh, he wanted to be numbered among those who sang to sweeten Ireland's wrong, even though he wanted to probe deeply into issues that were not on the surface. So he wanted to create a literature of a high standard, while at the same time singing to sweeten Ireland's wrong. In other words, he wanted to combine this national feeling with high literary standards. And of course, that was a very difficult uh, task to try to, um, uh, to accomplish. And uh, Yeats would later come to believe that this kind of popular literature was maybe uh, beyond uh, his ability to, uh, to maintain. So in, Yeats spent a lot of time in the 1890s arguing the case for, for a national literature for Ireland in the English language. But of course there were those like um, D.P. Moran, the editor of The Leader, who was a trenchant critic of Yeats and believed that Yeats was an inferior English poet and that he had no right to claim to be an Irish poet because he wrote in the uh, English language. So that, that debate about the language in which uh, Irish literature should be uh, written, that became an issue in the latter part of the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century. And this eventually soured Yeats towards the um, tradition of Irish nationalism that he clearly tried to contribute to and develop in his own direction during the 1890s. So, um, in 1899, um, Yeats 
together with um, George Russell AE and Lady Augusta Gregory, founded the Irish Literary Theatre. The theatre ran into difficulty early on uh, because they uh, did a production of Yeats's The Countess Kathleen, which was seen by some um, uh, in Dublin as uh, blasphemous and suggestion that an Irish woman would sell her soul uh, in order to, to uh, save the famine-ridden uh, people of her district. This uh, generated um, demonstrations in the theatre against the production of The Countess Kathleen. In 1902, um, Yeats's uh, nationalism came to a head when he, together with Lady Gregory, uh, wrote and produced for the Literary Theatre a play called Kathleen the Houlihan. Now this is unusual uh, for Yeats because it is so clearly uh, a piece of uh, political writing rather than a, uh, a piece of writing that happens to have a political theme. Uh, so Yeats, um, the, the, Yeats set this play, or Yeats and Lady Gregory set this play in, um, in the west of Ireland uh, in 1798 during the rebellion of that year. And uh, the Galan family, um, their son Michael is about to be married. The dowry has been arranged uh, with the family of the bride and everything is moving ahead towards their son's wedding uh, within a few days. And then an old woman turns up and she tells her story of having lost her, having had strangers take over her house, having lost her four precious fields and looking for help to try and drive the strangers out of her uh, home and reclaim her lost fields. This, of course, is, is clearly uh, an allegory uh, about um, uh, the British presence in Ireland and uh, the desire to, to remove that presence from Ireland. Eventually, um, the lady um, uh, tells uh, the family, including the son, Michael, who's about to be married, she says, um, those who come with me to help me rid uh, my house and my land of the strangers who've taken it over. They shall be remembered forever. They shall live forever. They shall be speaking forever. The people shall hear them forever. Inspired by this, um, these words, the son Michael decides to forget about his wedding and to go with the old lady and join the French who have invaded, who have landed in the west of Ireland uh, to free Ireland from uh, British rule. Um, so there you have this highly um, political play uh, to the point where Yeats later, in a later poem, asked, did a play of mine send out men the English shot? Other contemporaries took the same view. This was a very uh, incendiary play. This was a play that was insp inspiring people to, to take up arms against um, Britain. Um, at the end of the play, uh, a member of the family comes back and the father asks the son, uh, did you see the old woman who was leaving the house? And he said, no, I didn't see an old woman. I saw a young girl and she had the walk of a queen. So this is the personification of, of Ireland, Kathleen O'Hullohan, and the role of Kathleen O'Hullohan, of course, was played by Maud Gaughan, Yeats' um, um, romantic interest throughout the 1890s, and indeed throughout his life, he uh, never ceased to be infatuated by, by uh, Maud Gaughan, and she played the role of Kathleen O'Hullohan. So this was a kind of peak of Yeats' um, uh, commitment to uh, being a writer who sang to Sweden, Ireland, from. Uh, Things soured for Yeats, um, especially after the Abbey Theatre was established in uh, 1904. Initially, it was a great success, but uh, when the Abbey produced um, John Millington Sings Play by the Western World, there were demonstrations in the theatre against this play, which was perceived by some to be an insult to the, the people of Ireland. Um, uh, indeed, when the play came to America later, there were objections, uh, vigorous objections raised by uh, Irish Americans against this portrayal of the, the people of rural Ireland. Um, 
and Yeats started to become frustrated by his involvement in theatre business, as he called it, and the management of men, and eventually rather soured to Irish um, nationalism until the Easter Rising restored his faith in the possibility of Ireland being the kind of country that he had uh, hoped to contribute to the creation of in the 1890s in his effort to generate a literature for Ireland that would be uh, that would make Ireland beautiful uh, in the memory and would make Ireland uh, that would make Ireland sing to the people of Ireland to the benefit of, of um, Ireland's national identity. So what is clear that the literary revival did not have the same significance as uh, the um, founding of the Gaelic League which brought a lot of uh, people into um, political life and uh, many of the leaders of the Easter Rising were people who had become active in, in public life through their membership of the Gaelic League. Clearly wasn't as significant as the Gaelic Athletic Association which galvanised so many young people to take an interest in Irish games and, and to be proud of their Irish heritage. Nonetheless, the, uh, the idea that uh, Ireland could have a, a literature of its own that could uh, match anything in, um, in world literature it was a, a powerful idea and I believe it made a contribution, however modest, to the transformation of Irish identity in the uh, 1890s and into the 20th century, which paved the way for uh, the revolutionary decade between 1913 and 1922, which eventually delivered Irish independence uh, in the form of the Irish Free State established in 1922. So that's my uh, quick summary of um, my lecture on W.B. Yeats and the creation of a national literature. It's his contribution to the Irish, uh, to the development of Irish identity around the turn of the century. Um, next week I will be uh, talking about uh, James Joyce's Ulysses and particularly the Cyclops episode. I hope you will uh, tune in uh, to that summary in a week's time. Thank you very much.